This morning, I want to share a message with you that really uh, began rolling around in my spirit quite quite a while ago. It was uh, it was actually during the pandemic, and during the pandemic, you know, uh, March 2020, whenever uh, the church is shut down, it was really a tough time, right? We didn't know what the future was going to hold. We didn't know whether uh, the economy was going to crash. We didn't know whether we could go back to work. We didn't know whether we could ever go to church. We didn't know how many people this this pandemic would take out. It was an uncertain time. And I can remember being here at the church, and we were right in the middle of transition, and Pastor Brandon and I were taking turns each week. And I remember in the first few weeks, we were up here preaching to an empty auditorium. And uh, Nathan was with me, and he was leading in worship. And it was just Nathan and I, and Doug was in the sound booth. And, and some of you were watching on Facebook. And, uh, and that's, that's the way we were doing church. And it was a very eerie feeling to be in this auditorium with nobody sitting in the pew. Nobody sitting in the chair. They were pews then, I think. But it was very eerie to say, man, will we ever be able to get together? Will I ever be able to hug the congregation's neck? Will I ever be able to get to to, to worship with them again like this. Who knows what the future is going to hold? And then I begin to feel this tremendous burden of, I wonder how they doing. I wonder how the congregation is doing. I wonder if they okay. I wonder if they're, if they're, they're encouraged or discouraged or they're gripped with fear. Are they living in faith? Are they, are they, Okay, and not knowing exactly how the people were doing was a huge burden as a pastor to know how the sheep are doing. And then the next thought was, did I do a good enough job to prepare them for whatever is going to come? Did I, did I teach them the right things? Did I encourage them in their faith to the point that regardless of what happens down the road, they're going to be prepared and they're going to be ready. And that's, that's the burden that was on my heart. Did I do a good enough job preparing the congregation to face whatever they got coming down the road? And it's really in my quest, the question in my mind today. Is the congregation ready now? Are they prepared now for whatever comes down the road? How many of you know that's really important? That's most important because nobody knows what the future holds, right? I believe the lesson of spiritual preparation is something that we should all be thinking about because it's a major theme throughout the Gospels. Jesus taught it over and over again. We must get ready and we must stay ready for whatever comes ahead. Come on, are y'all with me out there? In fact, in Matthew chapter 25... Jesus used a parable to, to just set the stage of the importance of preparation. And I want to take the time to read it. But before I do, I just kind of want to kind of paint the picture in, uh, before we read the parable. In Jewish culture, when a man was ready to marry a, a, a woman and they were betrothed or engaged, what would happen was one day the, the, the bridegroom with his wedding party would decide now's the time. And he would go to the bride's house. And the bride would be at the house with her, her bridesmaids. Most of the times it was like ten virgins. And they were the bridesmaids. And they had a, a job to do. When the bridegroom would shout, or someone would announce, the bridegroom is coming. He would shout it. And the virgins and the, and the bride would come out. And, and, and the, the bridesmaids would would light their lamps and they would begin to shed light on the event and it would begin the start of the marriage festivities. And they had a grand old time. It was the Jewish custom. And it's from that custom that Jesus tells us, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. 
Five of them were foolish, thoughtless, without forethought, and five were wise, sensible, intelligent, and prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take any extra oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil along with them, also with their lamps. And while the bridegroom lingered and was slow in coming, they all began nodding their heads, and they fell asleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up to put their own lamps in order. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, There will not be enough for us and for you. Go instead to the dealers and buy for yourselves. For while they were going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were prepared went in, and with them to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he replied, I solemnly declare to you, I do not know you. I am not acquainted with you. Watch, therefore, give strict attention and be cautious and active, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. The bridegroom represents the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming. He's going to come back to get his bride. The bride represents the church, the bride of Christ. The ten virgins represents the spiritual condition of different people who are in our society today. Five of those ten virgins were called foolish virgins, which represented those in society who were thoughtless and without forethought. Those who had neither gotten ready nor stayed ready for the Lord's return. Five of the virgins he called wise virgins, which represented those who were sensible, intelligent, and prudent. Those who had made preparation and were ready for the Lord's return. The key lesson in this parable is in verse 13. Watch therefore, give strict attention and be cautious and active, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. Come on, how many of you know that is a sober warning from the Lord right there? The word watch in this verse means to stay awake, to be alert, to be vigilant, stay spiritually prepared. And so Jesus was making a strong point. Not everybody is spiritually ready, but everybody should get ready. Amen. So we need to get ready. We need to get ready and we need to stay ready because we don't know when he's coming. He's not sending a telegram, a, a text message, an email. He's just going to show up. So we got to get ready and we got to stay ready. Amen. Now, there's three life events we should all get spiritually prepared for. Number one, we need to be spiritually prepared for the normal trials and troubles of life. In, in John 16, 33, Jesus said, I've told you this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I've overcome the world. How many of you believe Jesus was telling the truth when he said in this world, you will have many trials and sorrows. So he warns us, you're going to have trouble in this world. It's not going to be easy. If somebody told you that, they lied to you. Jesus is telling us the truth. He's warning us, you're going to go through difficult times, so get ready. Amen. Why be prepared for the troubles of life? Well, because how you weather the storm determines your future. How you get through the storm is going to make a difference in your future. If you do good in the storm, you're going to have a brighter future. If, the, if you don't do good in the storm, you're not going to have a bright future. That's why he says we need to get ready. Are y'all with me out there? See, everybody handles trials and tribulations differently. Some people get bitter and some people get better. Some people get stronger during trials. Some people get weaker during trials, right? Some people, their trials and troubles are a springboard, and some people, it's a setback. During the pandemic, there were some people that were set back and some people that sprung forward. It all depends on whether they were prepared or not. See, because I couldn't see everybody, I didn't know how everybody was doing, I was wondering, who are the ones that were prepared and are doing good right now? 
And who are the ones that are spiraling? It all depends on their spiritual preparation. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells the story of a farmer who sowed seed. Some seed fell on four different soils. Some on the footpath, some on rocky soil, some on uh, thorny ground, and some on good soil. And they produce a crop 30, 60, and 100 full. As he begins to describe who those soils represented, which were four different people in the body of Christ or in the society that we live in today. That second seed, he said, represented the people who were not prepared for the trials and tribulations they faced in life. And this is what he said in Matthew 13, 20. The seed on rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Praise the Lord. God is good. Verse 21, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Wow. Some people's relationship with God won't last. It won't last trials and tribulations. Are y'all, he, are y'all still out there? The trials and tribulations of, of life for some people, causes them to fall away from the Lord. It doesn't make them better. It makes them bitter. I can't believe God let me do this. I can't believe God's allowed. What's God doing while this pandemic is going on? Why is somebody not calling me? Why is not somebody helping me? When, and there's all kinds of things, right? And then some people are saying, who can I help? Who can I minister to? Who can I encourage? God's on the throne. We're going to make it. We're going to get through it. It's going to be all right. Amen. Come on, what about you? How did you face the pandemic? You see, I wonder how many fell away from the faith simply because somebody offended them. Oh, you know what they said to me? Are you going to throw away your whole future because some bozo said something that was offensive to you? Come on, are y'all with me out there? I hope you didn't come here to get patty cake because it's not patty cake morning. Come on, are y'all with me out there? I wonder how many have turned their back on God because they got bitter at God because some tragic loss in their life. I wonder how many people have turned away from the Lord because they gave in and they yielded to the temptation of the evil one and they followed the temptation. Come on, how many of you know there's casualties every day? Here's the point. Some people are prepared to face the trials of life, and some people aren't. The question is, are you ready? Are you spiritually prepared? You need to get prepared. I want to just say in case I forget, coming to church once a month is not preparing for your trials and tribulations ahead. That's not how you prepare. You better get strong in the Lord. Amen. Are y'all with me? I might never get a chance to do this again for you, but I want you to hear me today. Get ready. Stay ready. Because who knows what the future holds for you. Amen. Come on. Are y'all with me out there? You know, years ago, I had the privilege of, of walking with two brothers, uh, like brethren, not blood brothers. Both were, were diagnosed with terminal disease. And I walked with both of them. One had what I call a casual walk of Christianity and one had a strong walk of Christianity. And I watched them weather the same storm. And one of them lived in fear. He lived discouraged. He lived depressed. He lived defeated the whole time. He walked through it. The other brother... That brother, he had faith. He walked in joy. He walked in peace. And they both died. But one lived and died in victory. And one lied and did. They both in heaven, no doubt about it. But I'm telling you, it for me, it made the difference of whether they endured the storm and how they endured the storm. Listen, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, look at those people there in Hawaii. Look at in Maui there. They, they had, they were living in the most precious parts of the globe. And in one instant, 
Fire devoured their community and life will no longer be the same for them. How about these people in Morocco right now? This morning I woke up and picked up my phone and they said there was over 2,000 people that died in Morocco. Just yesterday or a day before, there was an earthquake in, in California. Come on, how many of you know? We don't know. We don't know what we're going to face. But if we're ready, we're going to be all right. Come on, if you got that, say, I got that. Are you spiritually prepared? Matthew, our Proverbs 24, 10 says, if you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. If you fail under pressure, your strength is too small. Listen, notice what Jesus points out in, in that parable of the soils in verse, in verse 21. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems. You see, I think a lack of deep roots means you have a shallow relationship with God. You see, like in the Western world, we've settled for Christianity like I just go to church. That's not Christianity. You see, and I want you to know that unless you get past just attending church, you're never going to be ready for whatever life throws your way. You got to do better than just attend church. Great. I'm glad you attend church. A lot of people don't. A lot of people still trying to make their way back to church since the pandemic. You're here. Bravo. Great. But it's got to be more than that. Come on. I know this is tight, but this is right. And I want you to be prepared. I want you to be ready for whatever comes your way. And if you get your roots down in the Lord and grow deep in your relationship with God, it doesn't matter what happens to you. You're going to not throw in the towel. You're going to not give up. You're going to make it to the other side. And we're going to spend eternity giving praise and glory and honor to God. Amen. Amen. I was thinking about, and I asked permission, my brother Tony. And after that terrible event, a tragic event that him and his family went through, Every day I was there and I was talking with him. About the second or third day, I noticed a difference in his countenance. I noticed a little difference in, in his, his posture. And as we began to share, he said, you know, this morning I had time to spend quality time with God and God ministered to my soul. How many of you know that brother's going to be okay? He's going to be okay. It's not going to be easy. But how many of you know Eric today? He, he needs to get his roots deep. Amen? But listen, here's what I want to tell you. The time to prepare for the storm is not when you're in the storm. The time to prepare for the storm is before the storm. I mean, we, we live in Hurricane Alley. We know that you don't start preparing when the winds are 150 miles an hour. Stay bunkered in. Prepare before the storm. I don't know if this is true. The live oak and the water oak. I hear that the live oak has stronger root structures and is able to withstand and last longer than the water oak because the water oak roots are not as deep. I don't know. That's just, you know, I do know the live oak lives longer than the water oak. I'm sure of that. But you know, it depends on the root structure. And so every Christian is like an oak tree. You're either like a live oak or you're like a water oak. You see, I don't want to tell you which one you are, but I want to tell you, get your roots down deep in the Lord. Don't play casual Christianity. Don't put God, fit Him in if you can. Make Him the biggest priority because it doesn't matter what you're going to face, you're going to be all right. Amen. Number two, you're not listening fast enough. The second life event every Christian needs to be prepared for. He needs to be prepared for the difficulties of the last days. Second Timothy 3.1 says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. He didn't mince words, did he? Last days, a phrase that was used to denote a future time that will proceed and follow the decisive reckoning of God. 
This is what is called a prophetic word, which is the prediction of certain future events. Now, the Bible, how many of you know the Bible is a historical book? It'll tell you about things that happen, history. But it's also a prophetic book. It gives you information about events that have not yet happened, but will certainly happen. It's a prophetic book. 2 Timothy 3.1 is a prophetic word telling us about what we can expect in the future. And Paul warns us, the future will get down, as we get further down the road in our history, things will get worse and worse. I know you didn't come to church this morning to hear that. But you need to hear that. Paul warned Timothy, in the future, there will be difficult times ahead. In the Amplified, it says, understand this, in the last days will come set in perilous times of great stress, trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. The Bible is making us aware that the further down the road we get in history, the worse things are going to get. See, and how many Christians don't know that? They don't understand that. And they look at what's happening in the world and they say, what is going on? What Jesus said, what the Bible says. You see, listen, people's character and behavior, you know, it's going to get worse in the end times. And that's what 2 Timothy 3, 2. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They will be reckless, be puffed up with pride, love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them God. Godly, stay away from people like that. Whoa. Whoa. The further we get down the road in history, the more and more ungodly people will be. That's what Paul is telling us. And so if we see it happening in our society, don't be surprised. Nod your head and say, okay. That's what they were talking about. Jesus also warned us of great difficulties in the world. Worldwide chaos. Matthew 24, 4. Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place. But the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. Many will turn away from me, betray me, and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. But the one who dear endures to the end will be saved. Prophecy. Prophecy. This is what he said. Several signs you can look for as we get closer to the end times. Increase spiritual deception. People will say, I'm the Christ. Don't follow them. Increase wars. I don't think I have to say any more about that. Verse seven, 6 and 7 says, you will hear wars and rumors of war. Nation against nation. Increase natural disasters. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. I don't think I need to say any more about that. Increase Christian persecution. You will be arrested, persecuted, and hated because you are my followers. Would you say that Christianity is getting more welcome and, and, and make, made room for in our society or less? Persecution. A great falling away from Christ. Many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. N number six, uh, increase violence, hatred, crime, and immorality. Because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. Violence and hatred and crime and immorality will be rampant everywhere. Lawlessness means people will know, sense no right or wrong. It's just no conviction of sin or moral, or, 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 or moral wrong or right. They just do whatever they want. Doesn't this sound like the world we're living in? 
And you see, listen, I talk to people and they say, man, what in the world is going on? What's going on? Well, that's what the Bible says. What's happening in our world is exactly what the Bible says. Jesus warned us in the last days there will be difficult times. You say, Todd, why are you giving me all of that terrible news? Because I want you to be prepared. I don't want you to be shocked. I want you to be prepared. When you see all this craziness going on, I want you to have more of a strong determination that I'm going to follow the Lord because the Lord told me this was going to happen before it ever started happening. I know the word is right. I know the Bible is true. And I'm going to hold on to that. Amen. How do you get prepared? Verse 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. We need spiritual endurance which means having the ability and strength to stand strong no matter what. Listen, you can't stand strong in your own strength, in your natural ability. You need the strength of the Holy Spirit. You need the power of God. That's why, listen, if you're not sitting at the feet of Jesus every day to get strengthened by the Spirit of God, you are spiritually getting weaker and weaker. Are you all with me? I want to say it again because I want you to, if you hear nothing else I say, if you go day after day and week after week and you don't sit at the feet of Jesus and get into his word and pray and ask God for his help, you are spiritually getting weaker and weaker and you're not prepared for trials and tribulations or the difficulties that are coming down the road. I don't know how else to say it any better, but this is my chance to prepare you. If one day I'm in this auditorium and nobody's in here, I will say, I I told them. I told them, get ready and stay ready because you have no idea what's coming down the road. Amen. Number three. I'm going to quickly go to number three. The third and final life event Christians need to be prepared for is for the Lord's return. We need to stay spiritually ready for the Lord's return. In John 14, Jesus said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. They were troubled because he said, I'm going. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus informed his disciples that he would be leaving, but only temporary. He said, I'm going to come again. Jesus is coming again. And he's coming to get his church. The bride. Just like the bridegroom. The the bridegroom is coming and the bride says, here I am. The bridegroom is Christ and Christ is going to announce, I'm coming. But you're not going to get a text. You're not going to get an email. You're not going to get a letter in the mailbox. You're just going to hear the shout. The bridegroom is coming. Are you ready? Are you ready? What if it's today? Are you ready? See, the important question is, you need to get ready. Or not question, but statement. We need to get ready, saints. We ain't got time to play pity patty Christianity. We need to get ready. We need to get spiritually strong. Come on, this Christianity thing that we're involved in is not something that we just add on to our schedule. It's the most important thing in our life. It's the thing that's going to last for all of eternity. When heaven and earth pass away, we're going to spend eternity with Jesus in glory. Amen. So get ready for that day. Get ready for that day. The New Testament tells us the next major event that's going to take place on the Lord's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. I want you to see this graphic. So the first coming of Christ, he was born in a manger, right? And then he ministered three years. He was crucified, died, he was resurrected, and we had the church age. And then you see rapture, and then tribulation, seven years. And then you see the second coming of Christ. And then you see the millennium, thousand years. And then eternity. That's the prophetic calendar. Okay? So we're in the church age right now. Jesus is coming at the second coming of Christ and the rapture, according to what I understand, and most theologians teach, are two separate events. 
When the second come, when Christ comes the second time, he's coming on the white horse. He's not riding on the donkey. Revelations tells us that. And the church is going to be with him. And we coming back to the earth to rule and reign on the earth. But before that happens, the rapture. The rapture. See, in the second coming, he's coming to stay. In the rapture, he's coming to get us. And he's going to take us. I don't want to be in the tribulation. Now, some people believe, you know, the second, uh, the rapture is going to happen pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I don't know, but it's going to all pan out, right? And I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'm hoping it's pre-trib. In fact, I believe trib's already started. <laughs> Come on, how many of you ready to get out now? How many, how many of you ready for that, that mansion in the sky? Amen. But Paul gives us great detail in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. That's people that died. So that you would not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even as God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep or died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep or who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Imagine that day. Tombs are going to explode all over the graveyards. And those that have died in Christ, they're going to have a new, they're going to have their mortal bodies going to put on immortality, and their bodies and their spirit is going to be reunited with the Lord in the air. Amen. <laughs> Verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain, so there's going to be people still alive and remaining. They will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, some people say, well, you can't. Rapture is not in the Bible. No, rapture is a Latin Vulgate word for catching up, which is what this word says. And so, therefore, verse 18. Comfort one another with these words. So the Lord tells us that one day. The trumpet is going to sound. The Lord's going to come into the sky. And when he does that, the first thing that's going to happen, there's going to be the resurrection of the dead. Those that have died in Christ will be resurrected. Jesus was the first fruits, the first one to be resurrected, the first of many. There'll be the resurrection of the dead. And they're going to, their bodies and their spirits will be reunited with the Lord in the air. And if we are still around, you might be at work one day. And the trumpet is going to sound. It might be in the middle of midnight on the weekend. And the trumpet is going to be sounding. And you who, you and I who remain, when the trumpet sounds, we'll caught up to, we'll be caught up to be with the Lord in the air, with all those that were resurrected. And the Bible says there in, in verse 16, I think it's 17. We shall always be with the Lord. Come on, how many of you want to be with the Lord? How many of you want to live with the Lord? Amen. You see, we don't know what day that's going to happen. Like the five foolish virgins. They didn't know whenever they were, somebody was going to announce the bridegroom is coming. And there were some of them there. They fell asleep. That's those that just fall asleep spiritually. And they don't make their relationship with God important. Brothers and sisters, don't fall asleep. Stay awake. Stay prepared. Because if the trumpet sounds, you're going to have your dancing shoes on. You're going to be ready to, come on. You're going to be ready to sing David's song on glory. Amen. Amen. Now listen. A lot of people were in churches like this and this message was preached and they died never hearing the trumpet sound. But how many of you know, they died if they prepared. They were ready and they're in glory and they're going to be the first ones to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to have to wait for them. And once they get up there, then we get to go meet them and we're going to be there for all eternity. Amen. Amen. Come on, if you're happy about that, say amen. amen. Yes, amen. So are you prepared? Are you prepared? We need to get ready and we need to stay ready. 
the seed that fell on the, on the rocky soil. As soon as problems and persecutions came, they fell away. You don't know how you're going to do in the storm until you're in the storm. So you got to prepare now. Get strong in the Lord. Make your relationship with God serious. Spend time with Him. Listen, we invest in everything. We spend time doing what's important. Make sure that you spend time in your relationship with God. Amen? And that way, whatever you have to face, you're going to be okay. And no, listen, whenever you hear about all this craziness, I mean, just this week, I talked to two lost people and one saved person. And they were all saying, man, what in the world's going on? What in the world's happening? Somebody on our staff here, they live in rain. She couldn't even go back to her house at the end of the day because there was, you know, cops everywhere. They had, there was a shooting. There, there was somebody held hostage or whatever. And she was just, you know, man, what in the world? It's what the Bible says. Things are going to get crazy. But most importantly, you know, listen, if the Lord comes back, we got to be ready. But what if you go to meet him before he comes to meet you? What if your heart stops today? I can't tell you how many people I saw in this church on Sunday morning. And by the end of the day or the end of the week, they were in glory. In fact, one day that's going to happen to me. It's going to happen to you. Are you ready? Five foolish, five Un, five wise, five foolish virgins. See, the, the foolish, they didn't have enough oil. That's, that's symbolic of the anointing oil, the, the oil of your relationship with God. How many of you know he's the oil that we need? The five wise, they're, they're, their lamps were ready. But they say, can I have some of you all? <laughs> you want to get your own all, brother. <laughs> uh, uh, I've been, I've been working on this all for a while and it's mine's. This is mine's oil and I'm going to get up there before you. Amen. Come on. You got to get your all. But it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? If you hear today and you say, Todd, man, I don't know if I'm prepared. I don't know. If I'm even a Christian, I don't know if I'm genuinely saved. I mean, I'm at church today, but I know that doesn't matter. And today you realize, man, I need to get my heart right with God. With everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed just in respect of the Lord and everybody around you. If that's you, say, Todd, would you pray for me? Just lift your hand and I want to pray for you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? This is your moment. This is your opportunity to get your heart right with God. Can we just pray this prayer together as a family? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood for my sins. Lord, I want to be prepared for that day when I meet you. I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me for every sin that I've ever committed. Help me, Lord Jesus. Cleanse me today. I'm surrendering to you. I give my life to you. I ask you to save me and fill me with your spirit today. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. And amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'm not going to ask you. How many of you feel like you need to get ready? Because I'll be the first to raise my hands and say, I need to get ready. Stay ready. I need to keep pressing in. What about you? It's not the time to just get lackadaisical. We need to get strong, saints. How about, don't you agree? How many of you say, Lord, I need to be stronger? Come on, just lift your hands with me to the Lord and and as we make, as we just pray this closing prayer and, and just be sincere and genuine before the Lord and say, Lord, help me, Lord.
Help me, Lord. Help me. Help me to get my roots down deep, Lord. Help me to grow strong in my relationship with you, Lord. I don't want to play casual Christianity. Lord, I don't want to play games with you. I want to be strong in the Lord. And I pray that you would strengthen me. Strengthen me in my faith. Thank you, Lord for just giving me the grace, God. Give me a hunger for your word. Give me, Lord, a, a desire, Lord, to fellowship with you and to sit at your feet and to fellowship with the King of Kings. Thank you, Lord, for touching us today, encouraging us today, empowering us today. Lord, help us to be changed today through the power of your might. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody that agreed said, Amen. 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 God bless you. You dismissed. Kept you a little bit long, but it's okay. We're getting ready. Amen.